Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity you've given us to study your word together in this special format. I thank you, dear Lord, that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I ask that you would filter out any error, any foolishness, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse. And we find ourselves in the ninth chapter, Romans chapter 9. And one of the things that, that's really astounded me over the years is the things over which Christians often split. And they won't fellowship with each other over and one of the greatest of those things is the anger and the opposition to any concept of election, predestination, or the absolute sovereignty of God, which defines the very purpose of God. It, it seems amazing to me that anyone would, would want it any other way but I don't know how many Christians over the years have said to me, Steve, I, I want nothing to do with election or uh, predestination. If that's true, well, then you need to cut out some scripture. If you've followed uh, the last several videos, you've probably heard me talk about some things that are not mainstream. You just don't hear this stuff talked about very often in, in most church gathering assemblies. Now, I want nothing to do with election and predestination is more common now, nowadays than, than most people think. In fact, mainstream really doesn't give it much of a thought. That's just how outside the the mainstream thought processes it is with most Christians. Now, I didn't make up, folks, I didn't make up those words, and neither did any other Bible student. It is the revealed Word of God that the purpose of God according to election might stand, verse 11, 9-11, chapter 9, verse 11, 9-11, but it's interesting. So if you want a, something to remember, to help you remember that, 9-11. And you're going to cross the verse out. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or bad or evil, that the purpose of God, the purpose of God. Let me say that again. The purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Are we going to destroy that concept from the word of God? Verse 11, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand absolutely not of human works, but of the one that calls. Verse 25, as he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved, and whether you take that to refer to the northern kingdom or, or Gentiles, the context is clearly God's people, Jew and Gentile. Therefore, that includes us. Verse 26, and it shall come to pass that in the place, the place 
where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. And whether you take that place to be Palestine or the Gentile nations, wherever a Gentile resides, you know, such as America, where, where I happen to reside, where it is said, I am, I am one of God's people. The context is God's elect, his chosen people, Jew and Gentile in one body, that body being Christ. Now I want you to take a close look at verse 27 in our, in our present study here in, in chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. That's the word saved. That's sozo in the Greek, delivered. It doesn't say redeemed. It says delivered. I think it's important to take note of the fact many Christians will look over that and uh, breeze past that and see the word saved and think that it's talking about redemption. It's not talking about redemption. The word is saved. Delivered is the word. Not redeemed. The fact that they are the remnant indicates that they are redeemed. It is redeemed people who are going to be saved or delivered and it is articulated, those of you who are following through this in the original text, it's articulated, the remnant, according to election. How are they there? You say, well, they're there because they're good people, and you have a problem because verse 11 said it was not of works. So they are not part of of the remnant because of anything that they did. You cannot say that this remnant is redeemed because of anything they did because you would be contradicting the very text of the 11th verse. Folks, these are God's elect. Remnant, not of works, but of him that calls, and absolutely the remnant will be saved. My question to you would be, how many of them will, will not be saved? Is there any possibility that, that you can look at the verse and say, well, I, you know, I sure hope most of them make it. And yet I believe absolutely that the modern Christian opinion is that, you know, a lot of people are going to go to hell who, who could go to heaven if you just reached them. You know, poor God, what a terrible father he is who would allow some of his children to go to hell. Not only that, folks, what have you done to the finished work of Jesus Christ? Oh, you can rationalize around. Well, he did all he could, even though Christians get mad at me when I say that. That, that is the concept of modern evangelism. Jesus Christ did all he could, and the rest is up to you. There isn't any up to you. This is a remnant, not of works, not of anything they did, but of him that called, and they shall be saved or delivered. It's a passive voice. They have nothing to do with that. It is all the operation of the sovereign God. Continuing with the same thought. For, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. He will finish. Now my, my Bible says, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make up on the earth. Wow, I mean... There's a lot of concepts contained in that verse. 
The word work there, folks, the word work in the Greek is, is ergos. You won't find that here. In the Greek, you'll, you'll, you'll note that the word work is, is ergos or ergos. The word work here in our present text is logos. It's the word that you know as word, logos, logos. For the Lord will finish his word. The Lord will finish his word. That's the sovereign God. Do you think he will? And a short word will the, will the Lord make up on the earth and cut it short in righteousness. How did he do that? Did he cut it short in righteousness by saying, well, he'll judge the living and the dead. That God will show forth his righteousness and his judgment at that final great judgment day. No. In Christ. What work did he finish? In the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We have the word of God declaring in Isaiah that though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant shall be delivered. How? Because he cut it short in righteousness in the finished work of Jesus Christ. What did the remnant do? Nothing. What did God do in Christ? Everything. As Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, that's the Lord of hosts, the word means armies. It, it's all, it also has a connotation of, of uh, even though the word, the Lord of hosts, even though the word in the original text means armies, it, it, it means it infers a limitless company, innumerable. Unless it's a, except the Lord of the Sabaoth had left us a seed. Well, we know who the seed is. We had been as Sodom and, and been made like unto Gomorrah. Folks, look, look, let's throw out. I can't believe I'm saying this. Let's, uh, let's throw out election. Let's throw out sovereignty. Let's throw out the finished work of Christ. Where would we be? Sodom and Gomorrah. Fiery judgment descending on us. And another host, another unlimited number, innumerable number of individuals, a limitless supply of Christians despise election when if it hadn't been for, for the work of God, that's where we'd be. There is not in us any ability to placate God. The modern church has almost entirely departed from total depravity. There is constantly the presumption that man can do something to remedy his fallen condition, and he can't. Unless God had done it, we'd be like Sodom and we'd be like Gomorrah. And yet Christians, by the score, want to depart from the sovereign majesty of our God. I can't say I haven't looked forward to, the, to this verse. Listen to me, please. I speak to all of you who are confronted by others over this issue. Who, who You've written me and you've told me, you know, how difficult it is trying to explain election to those who take offense over it. Folks, this is your response right here. It argues in your favor, in your defense. Those who despise election need to know that without it, we would be as Sodom and Gomorrah. That we would suffer eternal judgment. I've mentioned this a number of times. Whatsoever God pleased, that he did both in heaven and in earth and in all deep places. 
He works all things after the counsel of his own will. Shall evil happen in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? I didn't write that. How many of you heard any minister quote that verse on September 11th, 2001? Shall evil happen in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? I, I couldn't believe it. This, folks, is a Christian testimony. The modern testimony is is somehow in the churches we got to get we got to get along with every other religion. You know, there's some good in them. We are the messengers of the truth. If you are a Christian, you can't see the prophetic significance regarding the events of 9/11, which brought forth from the world religious system a call for unity within all religious systems. Which, and I'll just go ahead and throw this out here, out there. I believe that that is the whole idea behind the war on terror, the idea of how to defeat the war on terror. But I, people have come up to me and said, Steve, why have we forgotten 9/11? I, this is just my personal belief. I believe we've forgotten 9-11 because we're trying to placate these other religions. If, if that's what you... Look, folks, if you can't see the, the prophetic significance in that, I, I feel sorry for you. And that was 18 years ago. Only one God and only one Redeemer. Not the Jesus of the Muslims, and the, the Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses, and not even the Jesus of Romanism, but the Jesus Christ of this book. He is the creator of heaven and earth, and it is his finished work and his finished work alone that keeps us from being like Sodom and Gomorrah. You try to keep the law, you stumble at, at one point, you're guilty of all of it. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. The Gentiles, they didn't try to be righteous. They didn't do anything to be righteous. They didn't. They didn't run after it. They didn't work for it, but they inherited it. They're not running after it. They're not working for it. The righteousness of faith, that's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. By the disobedience of the one, the elect were made sinners. Even so, by the obedience of the one Christ, the elect will be made righteous. The faithfulness is the faithfulness of Christ. The obedience is the obedience of Christ, not ours. These Gentiles weren't working for righteousness. They weren't seeking righteousness. They weren't running after it. They inherited it because Jesus Christ died in their place. I beg you people to search the scriptures and show me where you are made righteous by anything that you do. You are shown to be righteous not by what you do. You're not redeemed by what by what you do. You're not made righteous by what you do. But let me let me make sure you understand what I'm saying here. And I'm not asking anybody to agree with me. I just want you to understand what I'm saying. You're not made righteous by anything you do. You are shown to be righteous by what you do. Astounding how many people you know, Abraham was justified by, by faith, Steve. See, he was made righteous by faith. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He was made righteous by Christ and shown to be righteous by faith. You are made righteous by Jesus Christ. You also have the verse in Corinthians, He, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for who? Us. Everyone? No. Us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 
Gentiles didn't work for that. They didn't run after it. They didn't. They didn't look for it. I, I mean, it it hit them by surprise. They inherited it. It seems to me that the, the Holy Spirit is so carefully chosen illustrations that it's astounding that people can come up with a wrong conclusion. We are born from above. That is a marvelous illustration because right off the bat, we know that the baby didn't have nothing to do with it. But modern Christianity le leads me to believe, wants me to believe, that the baby had everything to do with it. Doesn't fit the model. Christ should have chosen a different model. Birth isn't a, isn't a good one. Because if I'm born from above, I didn't have anything to do with that. And that is exactly the truth. Christ was preaching the truth, and Nicodemus didn't grasp it. We're born by the will of God, not by the, not by the will of the flesh, not by the will of man. I think it's unfair to, to the text, to the word, to say, that, well, as many as received him, see, Steve, we had to receive him. To them he gave the power to become the sons of God and not finish it, finish, finish what's being said here. Who were born not by their will or by the will of the, f the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the will of God. You ought to finish it, finish the truth. Just as all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and then you stop right there, don't stop, finish it who were justified freely by his grace. You left off the gospel. I mean, that's just wrong. These Gentiles didn't do anything. They inherited righteousness. Can you imagine that the bulk of modern Christianity says, I want nothing to do with the purpose of God. The purpose of God, according to election. And Christians want nothing to do with the purpose of God. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. But Israel, this, this is the Israel that worked for the law of righteousness and did not obtain it. This is not a concept of, of inheritance, but a concept of reward. But Israel who followed after righteousness's law it's a genitive, law of righteousness, didn't obtain it. They didn't make it by works. They didn't make what they were looking for. I don't know how many people have said to me over the years, Steve, you know, there are two kinds of people. There are, there are the kind of people who try to obey the Ten Commandments and they'll go to heaven. And then there are people who, who really, they don't care about the Ten Commandments at all. And they'll go to hell God appreciates you trying. Well, I wish you'd show me scripture for that. If man's guilty in one part, he's guilty in all. For the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. That's condemnation. Israel didn't make it. Had God not elected a remnant, Israel would have been devastated. That remnant, up in verse 27, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, these are the ones following after the law of righteousness. The remnant shall be saved. I don't know who they are, but God does, because they are God's children. The Gentiles, they were the ones who are not my people, but through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's election, his purpose according to election, some from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue, inherited righteousness. What an, what an inheritance. Didn't do anything for it. I don't know how many Christians have told me over the years, you, you have to be holy. Steve, you got to be holy. Well, I am. Oh, you boast like that. I mean, you're going to go to hell. 
I'm not boasting. Not at all. God told me that through the blood of his cross, I'm holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. You can't bring any charge against me. That was the eighth chapter. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. When you lay a charge against me, you lay a charge against the finished work of Jesus Christ. Israel could not obtain it by works. What did they do? I mean, look at how that they relished the law. If you spit and it landed in the dust and it plowed a little furrow, you know, you, you did work. But, but if it landed on a rock, well, that's okay. It didn't move anything, you know. Work is force times distance. And it, it grew from the Ten Commandments to 400 volumes. They were zealous for the law. These guys really worked at it. They tithed. They were so zealous that if a Jew who really had a sense of the law, if, you know, if he found a, a dollar laying on the ground, he tithed it. Even though the law says it, it's a result of their work, the fruit of the field, the, res, the results of their labor. If they found it, they tithed it. That's how zealous they were. They didn't attain righteousness. Why? Verse 22. Or 32. Why? There aren't any verbs in this verse. I don't know what translation you're using. There's no verbs in that verse. My Bible says, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law. The verbs aren't there because the concept is is absolutely obvious. Why? Not from faith. My Bible says not by faith, ek, out of faith. Now the normal approach to that verse says, well, what it says, the, the normal approach says, uh, And I hope I say this right. Sometimes I risk giving people the wrong impression. It says that they didn't exercise their faith in God. Now, I want you to hang with me here. This is important. I think it's important. They didn't exercise their faith in God. I believe that verse says it's because they didn't trust or didn't rest in the faithfulness of Christ, but I'm also perfectly willing to admit that it's, vir it's virtually impossible to separate the two. For, because only one who's been redeemed, who's been made a new creation in Christ Jesus, Only one who has been born again because of the faithfulness of Christ can exercise faith in Christ. You just can't separate it. It's like someone messaged me the other day, Steve, what about, well, faith without works is dead. I don't have a problem with that. You got one, you're going to have the other. That's what, it's, what's, that's what James is saying. The two are inseparable. They're married to one another, if I could use that, that phrase. But I don't want you to get the opinion that what the text is saying is if any non-remnant, uh, non-redeemed person would just exercise faith, then everything would have worked. I believe the concept of the verse is because they didn't recognize that it was from faithfulness. Now that's how that's how I'm reading it. That's how I see it. Habakkuk, the justified man shall live by his faith. Some some translations capitalize the word his, and some don't. Some translations don't capitalize it. Some of them 
even just leave the word his out, the justified man lives by faith. I firmly believe that the Hebrew concept in that verse is that the justified man lives by God's faithfulness, and that's what the Jew didn't do. That's what he didn't do. Because not from faithfulness, but from works. And I want to point out here that in the text, there isn't any they sought. It's, it's not in the original text. The concept is clear. It wasn't from faithfulness, but from human effort. They couldn't keep the law. No Israelite kept the law. No one can keep the law. Christ kept it for you. And I pointed this out before the law was given to, to Israel. The law was never given to the church. Never. And yet the bulk of, of modern Christianity believes that it's all about living under the law. I, I, I just I can't help but find that astounding. No Israelite kept the law. No one can keep it. Christ did, though. He kept it for you. And therefore they stumbled at that stumbling stone. That stumbling stone. The stumbling stone, the word there is, is in the Greek, is uh, lethos. Now, there's a couple of words for stones or rocks, you know, more familiar ones to most Christians. Petra, a large one. Petros, a small one. This is lethros. It is the word that you would use for a precious stone. They stumbled at that stumbling stone, which was Christ. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Please, folks. I guess I opened up my own can of worms here. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I believe that the Holy Spirit expects you to have read other passages of Scripture. The only one who can believe is the one who has already inherited. John 10, why don't you hear my speech? Because you're not my sheep. How could it be any, any more clear? If ye were my sheep, ye would hear my word. I didn't say that. God said that. The basis of becoming a sheep is not hearing. The basis of hearing is being a sheep. You already have to be an heir born from above, or you couldn't hear, and you couldn't believe. That whosoever believeth, the word, the word, whosoever, is something that we throw around quite a bit I, I get messages emails I've gotten phone calls late at night Steve what about the word all what about the word whosoever no God does expect us to to have read and understood other passages of Scripture The word, the whosoever believeth, the word whosoever is something that, that we've got to understand in context. Behold, I lay in Zion a rock of offense, and all who believe on him will not be ashamed. And those are, those all are the remnant. They're all the election, the purpose of God according to election. Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? You'll never understand good news until you realize what you sing is true. Jesus paid it all. Nothing that you do, nothing you do, 
makes you inherit eternal life. Nothing you do makes you born from above. Jesus Christ did that. Believe him. Trust him. Moses, well, Moses was elect. And I, I think I brought this up in a previous video. He was elect from before the foundation of the world, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. But he did not believe God, so he never entered into rest. 12th chapter of Numbers, I believe. Because ye did not believe me, you, you will not enter the promised land. The promised land is not heaven. If you don't believe God, you don't know rest. Well, folks, that pretty much concludes the ninth chapter of Romans. We'll, we'll be moving into chapter 10 in the next video. I love you all, and I appreciate all of your messages and your kind words of encouragement and support. I appreciate your supporting this ministry. Um, we do not have a large following in these study videos, but I am absolutely confident that the word is going out and being received by those whom God uh, prepared beforehand. And, is, and so uh, it's never been about numbers. It's never, I've always been uh, fascinated with numbers per se, but this, this is the one numbers that I'm absolutely not interested in. I'm not uh, concerned about if, if all these videos got were one, two views and it was helping people, it would be worth it. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.